Good evening, and welcome to Wana Live, the reading series of the Writers Association of Northern Appalachia. I'm your host, Damian Dresick, and this is your other host, Christina Fasonic. How are you, Damian? It's been a very long uh, day, Christina. The weather here has been, I, I think it was, it's the kind of day that, that sort of um, makes one think indoors is the place for me. Oh, yes. It's very uh, wet and gross out there. It's oddly warm, though. Um, at least it is here in, in northern West Virginia, but it the rain had just ruined the whole day. Every time I looked out the window, rain, rain, rain. So, ugh. but we will warm everybody up tonight with our reader. Would you like to hear something about her? I would. And I suspect our audience is already indoors. Well, I should hope so. Though I'm looking forward to the months ahead when I can start broadcasting outside again, which is one, mm. one of my favorite you're, things to do. You're into that. Yeah, I am. So tonight, uh, Pat Hart is with us, and she writes plays, short stories, and novels. She is the founder of Free Association, a reading series for established and emerging writers of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction hosted by the City of Asylum in Pittsburgh, and is currently revising Mala, an historical novel set in 1925 about an elephant, her Burmese handler, and the people they encounter as they travel from Burma to England through Pittsburgh and ultimately the Barnum and Bailey Circus in St. Louis. Her playwriting credits include Book Wench, a one-act play performed at the Strawberry One-Act Festival in New York, and Murderous, a 10-minute monologue performed at Practice Monologamy. <laughs> Carlo, you know, I, I thought you were going to say a department meeting. <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, published short stories include The Reader, Everyday Fiction, The Vigil in the Writing Disorder, New Wife versus Old Wife, A Love Story, and Dragon Boogers, a novel excerpt in Voices in the Attic, and Spider Ball Rune. So let us bring her out. Hey, Pat. <laughs> Hey, hi guys. Nice to see you. Good evening, Pat. So, I always love and like a conversation about the weather. I mean, it's tradition in Pittsburgh. <laughs> never it's right. True. Never right. It's true. It's soggy out there and you just never know what's going to happen next, right? Yeah. So um, you are you reading from your work in progress? Yes. I'm just going to read a short excerpt from Mala. And uh, one of the, I picked a section that takes place in Pittsburgh. Excellent. Super Africa. cool. Now, now some of us are a little bit familiar with this from mm -hmm. your recent reading at City of Asylum. Yeah, familiar with the work, and I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I, I very much enjoyed uh, hearing hearing a, a chunk of it. Yeah, it was it was fun. I was uh, I was filling in for one of our readers who had COVID, so it was kind of a mad dash to pick a piece and practice it a little bit before I went on the went out. So. Well, I too really enjoyed that. So I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to hearing more. Okay. Cool. All right. We'll see you in a few minutes. <clears throat> We're going to disappear. Okay. Well, I'm going to set this up for you, everybody. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, this, uh, this chapter opens with uh, character Liam Reardon, who's a pig farmer on Troy Hill. And he is taking his pigs to slaughter. Um, the process was that uh, the farmers would drive their pigs to the top of Rialto Street, uh, which is very steep road for those who don't know it and the pigs will be pushed down the hill across a bridge over the channel a channel in the allegheny river to pig island where they would be slaughtered and processed now liam is very tender-hearted he's become extra tender-hearted after serving in world war ii and he is distraught at having get, given his pigs over to be killed he um has decided no more i'm not going to do this anymore and we pick up with him after he's given the pigs over and he is heading over to Pig Island to collect his money. So here we go. Brace yourselves. Anyway, <laughs> at the bottom of the hill, he suddenly turned and pulled open the door to Gooski's. The place was small, just a few tables across along, along one wall and a row of stools pulled up to the bar. The bartender, a white rag thrown up on his shoulder, nodded at him. Whiskey, Liam said. The bartender poured the amber liquid into a shot glass. Liam tossed it back and then tapped his forehead, forefinger on the bar. The bartender filled his glass. 
He drank that shot and then another. Each time the bartender waited for the tap of Liam's finger, the bottle propped on his hip. When the fish shot was set in front of him, Liam stared straight ahead, rubbing his thumb up and down the smooth glass. After a moment, the bartender sighed and went back to washing glasses at the far end of the bar. Liam tried not to think of the screams, tried not to imagine the slaughter on Pig Island, but still unbidden came the images. Blood-streaked men roping the pig's hind legs, hauling the animals up to hang upside down on tree limbs and drawing knives across their throats. Liam left Gooskies and walked unsteadily along the shore of the river. He had little trouble climbing the rickety steps to the wooden walkway to Pig Island. He stopped midway across the channel to grasp the handrails and vomit. The vomit swirled and drifted down the river, and then the water stilled and reflected Liam's image back to him. His untamed hair rose up from his head like twisting branches. He flattened the spires with his meaty hands, but they sprang right back up. Head hanging down between his shoulders, he looked like a heap of rags. He'd never been a handsome man. Even in his youth, his flesh had been soft and doughy, as though he were already middle-aged. But lately, he'd become downright bedraggled, unshaven, dirty, his coat unraveling. His wife spurned him, wrinkling her nose as she pushed him away, saying, you smell of pig. He'd given up bathing, since nothing removed the smell of pig from his hands, his hair. He slept in the barn most nights. He put one foot up on the rail and then the other. He leaned over and thought of the release of plummeting downward and into the green water. He thought of the chit for $244, the price of his pigs nestled in his breast pocket. That would be a great loss, he thought. But to whom? His wife would bitterly grieve the loss of the money that was all they had to feed them through the winter. But did she deserve to starve? He smiled and thought, yes. He could see her greedy fingers rifling through the pockets of his coat, unmoved by his watery corpse, but frantic to find the chit. Sodden, the writing smeared, the chit would melt away at her touch. He moved his foot up another rung. Then he heard the most fantastic, bizarre, and otherworldly sound blast from a distant point on Pig Island. Trumpeting. Trumpeting was the only word to describe the bellowing that started low, and blared shrilly. It was not the trumpeting of brass and reed, but a meaty sound. The note decidedly flat. It was an unearthly sound. It gripped Liam and pulled him off the rail. He walked slowly, dazed, his ears open, longing to hear the sound again. On Pig Island, he walked on a dirt path through a wood scrub of trees. Again, he heard the strange blaring and he ran a few steps out of the wood and into a clearing. Hogs stripped of their skin hung from the trees, but Liam walked past, unmoved by the scene of the butchering toward the sound. He broke into a run as he heard the trumpet blare again. It came from across the narrow island, only a few hundred yards away, down by the river's edge. Another fringe of trees blocked his way. He pushed through the wood, bending the slim trunks away from him. Thick undergrowth wrapped around his legs. He dragged himself through it until finally, he could see a strip of brown, sandy beach. Then stare, and there, standing knee-deep in the Allegheny River, trunks snaking along the muddy bottom, tossing a spray of water in an arcing plume, was an elephant. You guys got to come back now. <laughs> yes. I, 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 my my computer just decided it was going to shut down right at the as you stopped and I'm like no so so that was awesome and I can't recall what was the genesis for this novel where did you get this idea because this is a wide ranging story it's a very wide ranging story it's the first half of it it takes place in Burma with a um, elephant handler and his elephant, and he is in pursuit of his son who is fled across the world and he is chasing him. And he comes to our area. And this is our first introduction of him into the Pittsburgh characters who then join up with him and travel across the, across the country to St. Louis. 
And you asked what the genesis of this was. It was actually an NPR story. I'd heard, like, oh. oh, it was like years ago. And I was listening to it, and it was a story of a man coming in from the outer boroughs, which at that time were farms. And he was bringing his cattle in to the slaughterhouse. And when he went in, in one of the pens was an elephant. And he traded his cattle for that elephant. And then he went back and he took the elephant and he took the rest of his life just traveling around displaying this elephant to anyone that would, you know, he'd go from town to town, charge him 10 cents or whatever, and uh, changed his, just what he was doing to that. And I thought, wow, where'd the elephant, first thing I thought, where'd that elephant come from? Yeah. What does your wife think of this? <laughs> yeah. What's your plan here? from being, you know, a farmer uh, to being a guy who was a showman. And um, so that was the, the the genesis for the character, Liam. And then I needed to get that elephant to Pittsburgh somehow. And there was no Dumbo drop, so. No, not then. <laughs> no, they had to come by. Had to come, it was 1925, as you said, and they had to come by a boat and through yeah. a lot of different things, a lot of different challenges to to get here. I love that as as a like a metaphor in teaching creative writing. The, the getting you you got to get the elephant to Pittsburgh, right? <laughs> you know, it originally was going to be a sidebar on how the elephant got there, and it, it kind of grew into a, actually a three hundred page story. So this novel is quite long, um, but I think I'm going to probably be cutting it up into different pieces to to publish it because it's it's a little long for a for the publishing industry. They're like. Well, <laughs> Damien's right. I think that would make an interesting craft piece, you know, mm -hmm. how to get the elephant to Pittsburgh, you know, talking about that move and a work, how do you do it and what happens? And sometimes it is a sidebar, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's like a whole other novel or a short story or something else. Well, I, I like it as a metaphor for the idea of like, like your, your work doing what it needs to do. Like, like man, look, the elephant's still in Burma, Lewis. You got to get the elephant to Pittsburgh. Right, right. Okay, going nowhere. Now, I really enjoyed, um, A, it was very funny uh, that you mentioned Goose Keys. Yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I have been, I, I've been in, 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 uh, in Goose Keys and, and I, I did not see a pig farmer, but I would not have been surprised. <laughs> well, you know, it's actually located someplace different, but I moved it across the river and put it at the foot of Troy Hill for my own evil purposes. Oh. Move these keys off of the south side slopes. So you can do that in fiction. There you yeah. go. I also love the the idea of um, you know this historical novel, and I, I think that the, the, you know I'm not going to say anything people have said a thousand times, but there's in, in the present moment there's this tremendous disconnect between people farming animals and walking down the aisle in giant eagle. Mm. And it's, you know, nobody's really thinking about what, you know, not, not just how did the elephant get to Pittsburgh, but, you know, how did, how did the sausage uh, get to Giant Eagle? Mm -hmm. And when you, you kind of pull us back into this world where there are actual human beings doing this kind of work and dealing with the, the mental business of being a, a swine farmer. Right, right. And, and, and this man, his, he's always been tenderhearted with the pigs. And it, even as a boy, he had a hard time with this. But he just reaches a point where he can't do it anymore. And, uh, you know, and then his and then he he sees this elephant and he wants it. He wants it to be his. So that becomes a conflict in the story. Like. We're attached to the elephant from the previous and we know the elephant belongs to the to this Burmese man. And this guy wants it. So there's like that uh, tension of him trying to get the elephant from from its rightful owner. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's been a very fun story to imagine uh, and to research. And uh, I've, I've, I've a whole f fully enjoyed the experience of writing it. And it, that comes out in your work. I mean, the second piece I've heard from this, and it really comes out that you're really loving this, you know, yeah, process fun. of discovery. Um, I think when we when we first set out to write things, we we sort of cling to um what we think is going to happen but the longer you write the more you start to love letting the book take you where i mean it teaches you how to write it where is it going let's follow mm -hmm. let's go down that road you know yeah and i just thought of his wife when i first imagined her as like this horrible person but she's like my favorite character now and she's 
really emerged as a big part of the story and somebody you, you actually start to like and love. You have to love these people, right? Oh yeah. Yes. You know, you can't, you can't hate them. I mean, when you're working with them and you're creating them, you, you have to love them and uh, you have to find, you know, you have to find something to love about them, even the really bad ones. So well, the writer Jennifer Hegg says that too. She's like, it, it wouldn't be see fair. The world through eyes. What's that Damien? See the world through their eyes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And embrace their perspective. I, I love the, the, the kind of, I, I was reading something uh, about, um, you know, it tips for, for young writers. I'm, I'm doing an intro to creative uh, writing this semester. And, and the idea of making things crazy. And, and I really love the fact that that your character, ha, ha, you know, and, and the fact that, that his wife is telling you, oh, you, you smell, you stink, you stink of pig. And his response is, well, I'm not going to bathe at all then. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the kind of, it's, it's the kind of thing that, oh, yeah, I love that. It's just, you know. yeah. yeah. No wonder he smells. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sleeping in the barn. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah, his story far, with his wife is interesting. Yeah. How far are you into this? At this yeah, I've, I've completed it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm on my first, my really first hard edit through it. And okay. um, I'm about probably two thirds of the way through a final edit. And then, but I, I, I have been told I have to cut it in half. Mm -hmm. But here's my plan. I'm going to sell the first half, which is starts in Pittsburgh. And then it's going to be, I've got good news. There's a prequel. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's I love good. that. It's already written. <laughs> you know, a bunch of publishers have said recently that people love, try, you know, multiples of the same story. They want, they want a second part. They want a third part. They want a fourth part because yeah. if you're, if you're doing it right, people get attached to your characters and your setting and the story and they, they want to know more. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Right. And you put that work in it, you might as well make double the money. Yeah. <laughs> so now, Pat, you, you are also, you're not just writing this novel. You are also, uh, helping to curate one of Pittsburgh's uh, most beloved reading series. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that. And that you two are two of my readers. Yes. Very nice of you to give your time in that way. I really appreciate it. And you guys are great. You guys are there. Were you there? You weren't there on the same night. You came different times. But right. I read with you yeah. the night that you read oh, with Sheila. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. that was, that was a fun night. That was crazy. But, yeah, I started this, and it's funny that you 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 mentioned Mad Women, Christine, to me earlier, Christina, because I started writing after not writing. I have a degree in writing, but then I didn't write for many years. I was working, and then um, I went to Mad Women and found them very inspiring and great, and got on, you know, started writing again, and went to a couple conferences. And at one conference, a guy said, "You know, if you're going to be a writer, you have to prepare to be an author." you've got to be part of the literary community. You've got to find a way to help other writers. You've got to find a way to be part of that community or, or it's just going to be an isolating experience. So what I thought of was doing a writing series. So I started it in um, Wilkinsburg in like 2016 in a kind of an abandoned space. It was, you know, there were no bathrooms. We used to have to tell people drink responsibility. Responsible. This is no bathrooms here. <laughs> Before you come out, <laughs> yeah. take it easy on the beers because you're going to be sorry. That's and cool. um, so we did that for a couple of years, and then uh, we moved to City of Asylum, which which has been a lot easier and really fun. I mean, they're a great supportive uh, group, and I started it. And after those two arrests for public urination, yeah, yeah, they're great. And it's a wonderful bookstore and everything they do for writers um, is mind blowing and, and yeah. amazing and wonderful. And I love being in that space um, anytime I can. So, but we did, there's another uh, free association reading coming up. We were talking about that before we went on because the lineup is awesome. Yeah. Um, will you remind our readers in case they haven't seen it, um, who, who will be there? Oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, we yeah. know that Ace August will be there. Ace Boggess, Jane, yes, and Jane. What's Jane's last Bernstein. name? Bernstein. 
Bernstein? Jane Bernstein. Yeah, Jane Bernstein will be there. Where I'm blanking on who the uh, the other writer is. And there is one more writer. I'm looking for Mm -hmm. the notice for that because I, of course, um, follow you on Facebook. And everybody who's listening tonight should do the same thing because that's how we know all these amazing writers are going to be um, at City of Asylum. And the other writer is uh, Doralee Brooks, who's awesome. Doralee Brooks, how did I forget that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. she was on the show as well, and she was fantastic. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to that. That's great. That's on, um, is that March 3rd? March 3rd, yes. So, and at 3 p.m., right, at City of Asylum? So, before we let you go, I did want to say you have a fan club here. Oh, great. Um, Jolene McElwain, who's been on the That's show wonderful. before, um, she said she's so excited to hear you read, and I'm, I'm sure she um, really enjoyed well, that. Jolene. Jolene was a member of Write Club for a while, one of my writing groups. Nice. Yeah. I can't cool. tell you any more about it. No, I'll talk about it. Because <laughs> the first rule of Write Club is nobody <laughs> talks about Write Club. I've already said too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> the fact that we know it exists. It was bruises, though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Donna says, uh, Donna Zarella, oh, who's Donna Gisella, I knew Donna from um, Mad Women. Yeah. Yeah. And she's a friend of Wana for many, many years. She used to work with us a lot. Um, she said, it's good to see you. And she was excited to hear about your elephant novel and she remembers it. So she must have been in one of the workshops with you. It's been a long, been a long uh, journey. Oh, by the way, Jolene is laughing over here because of break. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then Jennifer uh, Randolph says, this story captivates me. Awesome writing, Pat. So. Thank you, Jennifer. And we have one more. Uh, Gil Hart gives you a My heart. brother. Aw. <laughs> that. Oh, wait. Did you see what happened? I did. Oh, yeah. yeah. How did it do that? <laughs> How'd you do that? It's magic. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh wait, we've got another heart in the uh, in the building. <laughs> I'm I'm part of a very extensive loving family. I'm very blessed. I've got That's sisters, wonderful. a brother, and everything, and a wonderful husband. Well, fantastic! So. And it's so good to talk with you and to have had you on the show. And thanks for sharing this book. And I know everybody. Um, is excited about uh you know seeing this book come to print so we can all read the whole thing um and how how does it feel though to read read something that's still in the works because i did that too recently when we read together and it's uh you kind of hold your breath a little but it's exciting right well yeah i mean i edited it a lot today i was like changing it as i was practicing earlier today so that's kind of fun reading it out loud is really important i think oh Oh, yeah. yeah yeah Well, Galway Canal said, um, he came to my university when I was a graduate student and he said, you know, um, the thing about it is I've never read the same poem twice because he would edit and I watched him edit his poetry before taking the podium. Oh, I could edit my name and it's only seven letters. Yeah. Yeah. I no, mean, and that, that's hard heart. No, hard heart. No, that, no, we can't decide which would be better. Yeah. yeah is it just PA? <laughs> So, um, thank you so much for being right. on, and we right. will see you at City of Asylum on March third. Yes, we'll, oh yes, please, I'll come. It's a yes. it's a great evening, and it's free, and it's free. That's right. All Good right. night, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you next week. See you next week.